Shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And delighted I am and thrilled I am to be talking to, all right, let's, let's face it, he's a Shagitz. He's not one of the tribe. But ladies and gentlemen, we have a veteran author, someone who has written everything, <coughs> excuse me, everything from novels to screenplays, to short screenplays, to plays, to short plays, basically everything under the sun that has to do with words, except the occasional bill. We have with us Richard Vetter. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He wrote Hail the Conquering, oh, sorry, Hail the Hero for General Motors Playwrights Theater back in, back in the day on TV. It was a TV thing. Um, the Marriage Fool. The Third Miracle, these are movies that he wrote the screenplays for. And he wrote the ever popular play Gangster Apparel. And he's got a new play that is going to be in, in sort of workshop reading mode where you can go see it for free on Monday night if you want to in New York. It's called Zaglada. And <laughs> it's about the Holocaust. So it's going to be great fun. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you please welcome to the neighborhood. Richard Vetter. Shalom, you. Richard. How you doing? Shalom to you. I'm doing great. Thanks, man. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're roasting. Is that Sinatra behind you or is that young you? No, that is me. Not that long ago, but I realize now I don't have a beard. Someone in Tel Aviv actually um, saw this on Facebook and painted my portrait and sent it to me. It's gorgeous. Her name is Oren Siegel. And I'm glad you reminded me. I have to write her. I owe her an email. Yeah, if you can get written in Hebrew, just uh, send it to me and I'll, I'll do it for a couple of hundred bucks. But let me, when, were you ever in Israel? I mean, I, I feel like you must have traveled everywhere. So. No, that's one place they didn't hire me to write anything. But I'm hoping the play, Zaguada, will be done there someday. It was published in 2019, right before the pandemic. And um, the pandemic stopped two world premieres. But then this September last year, uh, Banner Elk, in Banner Elk, the ensemble stage, and all the places in the world, North Carolina, did a world premiere. And it was amazing. There were a lot of non-Jewish people. Some synagogues came. We had standing, ovation, standing ovations every night. And one day I'm sitting in the audience, and this woman turns to me and says, and there are Holocaust deniers? And I looked at her, and I said, yeah, that's why I wrote the play. One of the reasons I wrote the play. And it was cool. It was very cool. This is so, no, it's, I mean, because I wouldn't necessarily think of you as the person to be writing a play about, you know, an ex-Nazi or potential ex-Nazi and, and, and all of that. I would figure your Malou is more of the Scorsese Coppola area. I mean, are you, are you Italian? Yeah, I'm, I grew up in Maspit, Queens. I'm Italian-American, though I did my DNA, and it seems like I go right through the Middle East right through uh, to actually Pakistan, but it goes way up to the North Sea. So Naples is where my family's from, and it seems like Naples, everybody passed through. So, but why I wrote Zegwater is growing up in Maspid over the years when I was a kid up until recently, there'd be always somebody being arrested for um, um, entering the country by lying on their passport applications. There were it, it was a German neighborhood, became a Polish. It was German where I grew up, now it's Italian. And then it was Polish. And just a couple of years ago, uh, a guy was arrested, just two, two or three years ago, right before the pandemic. And it was seen that he was a capo in a concentration camp. And as he got arrested, the thing he said to the police is, why are you arresting me? I'm not a Jew. And I went, oh my God, I've been thinking about writing this place for decades and I just found my way in. So um, I did a lot of research, a lot of research. And, um, you know, we didn't talk about the Holocaust in my family at all, you know? So everything I had to do, I was even telling my brother, he came to a reading at the Kosciuszko Foundation last February. And I said, did we ever talk about it? He said, no. And so my research brought me to, when it came with this guy getting arrested, I created my own story and it's really, you know, people are telling me, uh, Eva Fogelman, it's really not a Holocaust play, but it's a play about um, the Holocaust, but told from a Christian point of view. 
Oh, just like those Carmelite nuns who tried to, to camp out on Auschwitz. So, yes, yes. So kind hard. of a little bit like that. Oh, I'm wondering, I didn't get this to, unfortunately, I did not get to see it because I was not in New York at that point. But are you familiar with the soap myth? That was a show that Edward Asner, who, who was a friend of the neighborhood before he plots, but he was in this, going all over the country in this show called The Soap Myth, which huh. was, here. it was kind of like, um, and as I recall, the, the plot was that these Jewish organizations were trying to kind of tamp down the idea that the Nazis made Jewish people into soap and lampshades and things. And he said, he's like, no, they dig it. I know it. They dig it. And it's sort of the back and forth on that. So it's kind of maybe something you want to watch. You can find it on YouTube or something. Or you can just go buy a bar of Irish Spring and, and imagine it for yourself. But we are here with an Italian winter here with Richard Bitter. Congratulations on Zaglada. So, so how was the pandemic for you in terms of trying to continue being a writer? Did you just sit down and write more novels then because there was nothing else to do? No, you know, it's really interesting. A writer spends a lot of time in isolation. So I did a lot of writing like I always did. I swam every day well, when the pool opened in New York. The pools opened around July of the that year. So I would go swimming every day. It was an outdoor pool. You had to wear your mask when you were around the pool. And I, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I got to, I went to visit my girlfriend, but we stayed outside. So it was a normal me writing kind of. The only thing I really missed was rehearsals. I'm also an actor, so I couldn't do any acting. But, you know, I, I you know, I had a couple of novels published and, 2000, 2001, and I did a lot of writing. So yeah, right. I think two, that, two, 20 and 221. What do you mean? Did I say 2000? Yeah, 2021. Yeah. 2000, got, got it. So, so when did you, I mean, the typical question, when did you realize you were a writer? Was it elementary school? Was it much later than that or when? Yeah, I started in elementary school. Uh, it's a story I tell a million times. I had a crush on the girl next to me. And she brought in a poem from her boyfriend who was much older and in Vietnam. I went to St. Stan, Stanislaus and she showed me this poem and I'm looking at the poem going, God, this looks familiar to me. It felt familiar. I went home and wrote a poem. I brought it in, gave it to her. She gave it to the nuns. I was taken all over the school as the poet. I was known as the poet from, what was that? Six how, how often did you get beaten up at that point? You no, know, everyone asked me that. No, actually... Even, they didn't call you poet fag. They you didn't, know, you're not getting any of that. No. Even tough guy mob guys would always kind of be rather respectful of the writer, the playwright, the poet. It was like in there, they always said something like, yeah, I, I'd like to do that. <laughs> you know, so, wow. yeah, you know, uh, Eisner, uh, I forgot his first name, Eric Eisner, over at uh, Disney at one time asked me when I was in LA. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Michael Eisner. Michael Eisner, yeah. the head yeah. of Disney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I had an, I, I had, a, um, I had an interview with him on a play that he was thinking about making a movie out of, and he asked me the same question. I said, no, it's the exact opposite. I was from the neighborhood, but at the same time, I didn't tell him I went to Columbia for my master's in comparative English literature, but the guys I hung out with who I grew up with were always really respectful of it. It's really weird, but they were. Can I ask you, <clears throat> since you brought that up and since you mentioned, you know, this because you have an agent and you get published and you get, not, you don't just put something that goes in a drawer. It gets done somewhere, no matter what you write, pretty much. So, but when you have to do a meeting, I mean, a real Hollywood meeting, not with some 22-year-old reader and not with some prexy who just come up from the mailroom and is now suddenly an associate assistant vice president, but the friggin' head of the friggin' Disney. How do you not just go on your knees and beg and say, give me a million dollars, make my movie, and I will, I'll blow your family. Wow. How do you go through a meeting like that? It's not easy, like you just said. You, you, you try to prepare for it. I got to tell you, the story I tell a lot is the best meeting I ever had, my agent and William R. set me up with a uh, woman at Paramount. And as soon as I sat down, I had all my notes ready to talk about things. And you know what she said to me? Tell me what you have at home in your drawer that you didn't come here to talk about. And I thought that was the best question ever anybody asked me. So I had been working on a novel that was a clumsy 550 pages for years. And it was called The Third Miracle. And it was about a priest investigating the potential sainthood of a woman who'd been dead for 10 years. 
When I told her that, she said, that's interesting. I left. My agent called me at the hotel and said, why did you never tell me about this third miracle? I said, I didn't think you'd anybody be interested. Make a long story short, it was made into a movie. Coppola produced it. Ed Harris plays the priest. Anne Hesh was the, the saint's mother. Yeah. And um, I love the film. Ignishka Holland, the famous Ignishka. I'm looking at the poster now. Ignishka Holland directed it. Yet my movie Vigilante, which I also really like, that has a cult following. Um, uh, Bam called it one of the best indies of the 80s. But I wish more people got to watch The Third Miracle. But that was a meeting that I'll never forget what she told me, that woman. And, and that, wind up, yeah, and it wind up getting made. No, because I, I had the same thing. I had a meeting with someone in, in, in the industry. And they asked me, OK, you, you wrote that. You want to do this show and your Shalom Dammit. But what do you have in your, your drawer? And I told her, a butt plug. And <laughs> never heard. A, in fact, my agent dropped me immediately after this. <laughs> Comedy! We're doing this on Dave's Gone By with me, Rabbi Sal Solomon, Richard. <laughs> my audience here, they're, they're just sitting here in, in shocked, horrible silence. What did you learn, since you went to oh, 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 Columbia, what did you learn getting an MA from? Do you wish that you were taking something very different from literature and writing? And that, or, or it, was, it was the right thing to take. What, what was the best thing you learned from there? Well, number one, I learned the best thing I learned was I don't know a lot. Um, I was I got my message when I was 22 and I had gone to St. John's University. I was known as the poet. I was one of the literary manage, uh, managers of the magazine. And I had a mentor, Dr. Iannucci, who said, you belong at Columbia. And I didn't think I'd ever get into Columbia. And I was telling this story about mentors that he set me up with a meeting. I met this professor there and he said, you're the kind of student we want. And I remember the first day I went to, I got in, he said, don't forget to apply. I did, I got in and I had a headache the first day. The classes, you know, the existentialism, nothing. I studied with the best. Lionel Trilling, I studied with on Jane Austen. Donato, I studied, studied Melville. Kinley, I studied Ulysses from James Joyce. So I left Columbia realizing I knew very little. There were a lot more smarter people out there than me. But um, I got my master's in comparative English literature, which I'm, I'm looking at now the uh, certificate on the wall. It, it was one of the things I'm thrilled at because my nephews have all gone for master's, Notre Dame, whatever. Guess what? None of them Ivy League. Their uncle is Ivy League. <laughs> It matters. It's just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Now, the one to, speaking of young and learning and stuff, it's interesting. I, I read an interview with you from a couple of years ago. Where you know, people ask, "What would you advise young writers or people who want to be in the movies or script playwrights and things like that?" What do you would drive? And it's nothing to do with tell your story and know your narrative. Your thing is learn the business. Is this true? Yeah, no, I do tell a, a lot of writers still this day, write me, call me, ask me business questions. How do I handle this? I usually direct them to the Writers Guild. I'm a lifetime member of the Writers Guild of America East. I love it because they right now, if I can say, I have a show running on Amazon. I have a movie with Walter Matthau, Carol Burnett and John Stamos. It's called The Marriage Fool. It appeared on Amazon after being the highest rated movie on CBS 20 years ago. So my guild is trying to get me, my union is trying to get me royalties. So I always tell writers, read your contracts, learn what your rights are. There are different rights as a playwright, than a screenwriter, as a novelist, you gotta know. Um, and, and that's something I always tell them, you know, know the business of this business. You know, I, I've been lucky. I had smart people around me, but I always like to teach myself what I need to know. Like Zaguada, we're reading Monday night with Len Caru, which is like pretty amazing. I know, I know. I'm going to see him right after this because we have rehearsal, our first rehearsal. Um, and, you know, it, it, this is like what is published so we would want to get it commercially off broadway that's our plan we want to get it done in new york so there's all kinds of legal things one must know you know movie rights streaming is a new thing now you know streaming is new the marriage fool is streaming and when i was on council with the writers guild at that time in 2012 we weren't really sure how does one know 
that you are, your show is being watched when it's streaming. It's up to the producer to tell you. It's no longer when Vigilante came out, my producers stood in the lobby and counted people, you know, on a little counter. It doesn't go like that anymore. It's streaming. It's weird. It's really hard to find. We're getting to know how to do that now. But it's digital life is really different now. Can I ask you, mm -hmm. um, you must have, back, my God, by 1997, when you were interviewed by the Daily News, New York Daily News, you were, you said you already had like 40 plays written. Yeah. Is that up to 70 or something? I mean, I'm, and, and, and I, I, I'm connected to that. Since you have an agent and you, since you have a commercial, do you feel the pressure to write, oh, I, I want to write a novel because this could be made into a thing or published, or I, I should be working on screenplays. What the hell am I going to write a, a one act play for or, or a short or a, uh, something that's just going to be off off Broadway. I'll never make a dime from it. How do you, how do you balance that as a professional writer? Well, I'm, I, I'm probably one of the last few people who call themselves an artist because I write what I want to write. I've been really fortunate that my stories have been made. You know, The Marriage Fool was a story about me and my father. John Stamos played me, Walter Matthau played my father. The Third Miracle was about a miracle I heard about when I was a kid at St. Stan's, and years later, I write about it. So Guada, like I said, happened in my old neighborhood. So I write what I want, and then, you know, it's really weird. you got to trust your own vision that it will get done. You know, I, I didn't realize when I developed this at the actor's studio, um, you know, for the PD, uh, w, the unit, the playwright director's unit, I had a lot of difficulty that some of the people at the studio were upset that I made the antagonist Kozlowski, the capo, who's Polish, you know, that I was making him a bit sympathetic. And I was like, well, you know, that's th the point is Sonia, wh whose mother and father um, uh, survived Buchenwald, is the Homeland Security agent trying to prosecute him for war crimes. You know, you don't, we don't do that here. She has to extradite him to a country that does. And there's no statute of limitation on international war crimes. So I said, you know, I don't really know if anybody cares about this. I do. And I really think when an artist cares about something and they, you know, they have the skills to craft it, people will, will come. Uh, you know, people will come. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't, or at this point, you still don't have to make the Nazi capo black and transgendered. Soon you will. Soon it's going to be a part of the whole. Somehow back in the day in 1943, uh, a black transgender capo was there. And nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what I do in the play is that it is a, a woman journalist who happens to be black who wants to interview him because she's doing a story comparing slavery and the Holocaust. And that's who he takes a shot at. So I want the play to be controversial. I do want to deal with the idea of Black Lives Matter, Holocaust, or a lot of issues in the world that younger people don't really know a lot about. Black Lives Matter, they, they, do. Know, they know this. But yeah. Holocaust, they don't. So World War II, they don't. I know because I lecture at Queens College and I ask them. Luckily, some of them are really smart and take classes on history. But um, I wanted to combine that as an American because I'm an American. I'm not a European. And then I have my Italian American uh, NYPD cop of um, Homeland Security liaison who really doesn't want to, he doesn't care about what went on, you know, 70 years ago. He can't believe he, he has to arrest this guy who did these crimes in a war that he has no, it was nothing to do with him. He said, I got terrorists, I got real terrorists I got to deal with, not a 90 year old man who's dying of four stage cancer. So I want to throw all the issues out there. So you leave the play asking questions. That's all I want people to know. And I want them to be informed. Like, you know, my buddy Israel Harvitz, who really helped my career early on, had said to me, you know, there are some plays that make you uh, entertain you, which is great. And there are some who make you think of your own life. That's the kind of work I do. So, you know, when I get lucky and it gets done, I'm thrilled. So many questions just from, from talking about all these things. And people also, I like anecdotes on the show and people you mentioned. So it's sort of like, you know, Israel Horowitz, if people don't know who he was, a, a playwright, he had a couple of shows on Broadway. Uh, also, Line, which is one of the longest yeah. running off off Broadway. So they did 13th Street Theater for like yeah. 27 years. At the same time, 
Uh, unfortunately, his his reputation has been tarnished in later years. His own son is ashamed of him because apparently, allegedly, I mean, how do you reconcile the Israel Horowitz that you know as a playwright who re- was a, really helpful to you and a sometimes brilliant playwright with someone who allegedly, apparently, was in not quite Harvey Weinstein territory, but you know what I'm talking about. How do you? Oh yeah. yeah it, it's tough because I've had some women friends very upset with me that when he passed away, I mentioned it on social media. But hey, I was friends. I am friends with his wife, his family. You know, his, his uh, Israel's daughter, very successful producer. I'm friends with the family. So am I supposed to like disown them? I, I know people that went to jail for other crimes. And I'm friends with them. You know, they're out. Who, who's in jail? Who, who you know? I'm just curious. No, just, any murderers? Any? Uh... No, no, no. Mo- mostly, uh, mo- mostly. Uh, I don't want to say anything. Tax fraud. Yeah, but but, yeah. but not that kind of crimes. You know, mo- mostly. Uh, what would you call it? Uh, fraud, gangster stuff. You know, gangster stuff. That kind of stuff. What the, know, what the, the, without putting anybody in jeopardy, you mentioned mafia types that yeah. you grew up. You. How close to that world were and are you of the Cosa Nostra and all that? They just arrested like one of the biggest for 30 years. They were looking for one of these guys out in Italy. They found him. So how? Oh, that guy. Yeah. When I I got a a movie in Rome, it was never made, but they flew me to Rome. And that's when Falcone was killed. Remember Falcone, the two DAs. There was another DA in Italy. Those guys really were trying to get, get at the Sicilian mob. And boy, you know, I was in Naples. I saw what goes on. In my real life, you never know. Danny Aiello was a really good friend. And we were at a restaurant, a, you know, famous celebrity restaurant. And a guy comes over and he uh, he shakes it, uh, Danny's hand, says hello, says hello to me. And as then he leaves. And then Danny goes to me, do you know who that is? I said, I think I do. And he says, you just shook hands with him. You don't know that his father is one of the biggest mob guys around. And if the FBI was outside, or somebody was watching, they would say, you know him, you got to be careful. And I, you know, you never know who you're with in that world. And you don't want to ask, you know, anyway, one, of, one of our friends of the neighborhood uh, just passed a day ago, his name is Jerry Blavitt, who is a uh, well-known DJ in Philadelphia. And one of the things, you know, the, the tarnish, if you will, on his Life and careers, apparently he had mafia connections and he was a driver for them. And and so, you know, he did all these wonderful things for radio, but I mean, you wonder, I mean, but at the same time, you wonder, well, did he have dinner with these people and that was it? You know, he never killed anybody. He wasn't a, a made man right. or any of these things. I, 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 but, but getting back to stories and things, I hope you don't mind my asking again, like you had a movie mm-hmm. done with Anne Heche. Yeah. Was she normal yeah. back in the day? I really loved her. I, you know, we were talking about who would be perfect for the character of Roxana. And then when they, uh, you know, it was really good. You liked this story. Um, I'm in a hotel in LA and I get a phone call from my agent and they go pick up variety. And I say, okay, I pick it up and it says Holland, Hesh, Harris, Bind, Miracle. And then I said to my agent, didn't they, the, uh, the option lapse? They had forgotten to re-option it. They were so busy trying to package it. So we made some more money. And then I said, Anne Hesh, that's interesting. And I met her on the set. She was warm. She was sweet. And I have some gossip, but I don't want to share. But I have to tell you, I thought she was wonderful. Um, Ed Harris was great to work with. Ed Harris was pro 100%. Great guy. Well, why won't you share the I mean, she's dead. Why won't you share the gossip? Who was she stopping? I'm just. Oh, no, well, that's when she was seeing uh, Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. All right, all right. Oh, all right. Yeah, and, and Ellen came up to watch the filming, and it was, you know, I wasn't directing the movie, so I'm only like, uh, you know, distant <laughs> here. But I know that it, it, it kind of was a little. It was the big scene between, if you see the movie, and Roxana and Ed Harris is the priest, and they come together romantically, and it's really hard to shoot a scene with an actress who's come to that and, just yeah. for that, just for that. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No, no. How about any Walter Matthau stories? Oh, my and and Carol Burnett story. I'm sure Carol Burnett was a doll. But what about Walter? Walter was like amazing. When I found out we got Walter, I was like blown away. But I will say what I heard 
was that Walter wanted a million dollars plus one for, for the work on the marriage fool. And when they said, why one? It was because Jack Lemon got a million and he wanted one dollar more. He, he was great. He worked, he worked so hard. The fun thing was I'm home. I get a call. This is before I met him. And he goes, it's Walter. So I said, Walter, Walter Matthau, I have a question. I want to change the line. I want to change hot dog to Frankfurter. Frankfurter is funnier. I said, okay, I'll fax you to change. And then he faxed me the page of what he wanted to change. And I went, I called my agent, Walter Matthau just called me. He was really great. He was really great. The only thing is he didn't understand what the title, the marriage fool meant. So here we are at a big dinner before the first day of shooting. And he said, I don't understand the marriage fool. What does it mean? And I went, oh my God, in front of everybody. But he worked hard. He was really funny. John Stamos, I hung out with John, was great. And Carol was terrific. You know, she also had a problem with the fact that she had to play a character from Queens. So she asked me to do some rewrites. So I went up to her penthouse. We sat down and we worked on a monologue. And we got really, really comfortable together. That one shooting one scene on the set, if you see the movie, she's in the car. It's their first date with Walter. And she said, I want to say something here. So right on the spot, I had to, I said to the producer, give me a piece of paper and a pen. And I wrote her a little monologue. She loved it. And then she did that Tarzan thing for the audience, for all the people that, you know. Oh, just, just off camera. Yeah, just to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. She did it off camera because there were all these people watching us in Toronto and she did it. She was, she was really lovely to work with, too. Um, you know, it's, you know, when you work with people like that, you got to gotta relax and not be you know, because you got work to do. So you, you're in awe for a couple of minutes and then you go, OK, I got to do this. <laughs> Can I ask you who and, and if they're dead, name names, if they're who is the most difficult, awful person? It could be an actor, could be a director, could be a producer, even the, the worst of the worst that you had to deal with. I, you know, I, I really can't remember anyone being difficult. Uh, not to me, not to me. Um, you know, as the writer, you're not in, you're, you, you work kind of closely with the director, you know, and then then you're kind of gone. You know, you, sometimes they ask you your thoughts. Vigilante was my first movie. My director, William Lustig, is, you know, he's a legend in the indie world of horror movies, action movies. And uh, he was under a lot of stress to get a movie made. It took us a year, I think, if not longer, to shoot Vigilante. Um, he and I, you know, worked on how the script was going to look. Um, producers in the theater, I don't, nobody really, you know, you do get some people, but they're not really famous, who I think it's mostly insecurity that get really nervous, you know, and they don't know how to deal with it. But as I'm older now, let's hope I don't run into anybody. Um, you know, I've worked with everyone from like uh, Chris Walken, Alec Baldwin. So, uh, well, we, you made it for Alec Baldwin alive, but Christopher Walken, come. Do you have a Christopher Walken story? Not a bad one, just any it's Christopher real. Walken story. It's not a bad story, but I love it. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm at a party, I'm the, I, I, and I walk into this club in uh, LA, and there's Chris, and he goes, Richard, and I run over Chris. And that's where the conversation usually ends with Chris. It, 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 and then I was in his house once and I went up to see him and he goes, Rich, I go, Chris. And that's the end of the conversation. He was the hardest guy to actually do small talk with. I got to tell you, but I've been lucky. There was a place called Columbus. Um, it's gone now, a restaurant. And it was just for celebrities. And one night I was sitting with Sean Penn, Chris Walken, Harvey Keitel, Christian Slater, Hall from Hall and Oates. And we just hung out at this table until we all went to the China Club. Um, and then Richard Belzer once invited me to a show at, uh, I took him to dinner and then he said, come to my show, bring a date, sit at my table. Get there, the place is packed, but our table's empty, but me and my date. So we have a martini and I'm like, the place is getting crazy. It's 20 minutes late. I run to the bathroom, I come back. My girlfriend's got this look on her face and I look around the table, you know who's sitting there? At our table, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Chris Walken, John, uh, John uh, Hall from Hall and & Oates, and Harvey, I said Harvey Keitel. And I was like, 
and the whole room looked like, who is this guy sitting at this table? And I just remember looking across to De Niro and he gave me this smirk, like this smile, like, yeah, this is some table. So that's the and kind he of- realized, you know. Yeah. He, oh, here's one last one. At yeah. Columbus, Paulie Herman, who unfortunately just passed away, managed Columbus. And he and I got to be really friendly. And he'd always say, when you come to the restaurant, sit at my table. So I get a call on a Sunday afternoon. And he comes and I go, yeah, I got some friends I need to you to talk to until I get there. Sure. I go, first person to show up is, um, is um, uh, what's his name? Barishnikov. And I'm okay. sitting there going, that's Barishnikov. And I'm talking to him, right? Then I turn, as we're talking, the next guy sits down at the table. It's David Bowie. So I'm sitting with Bernishnikov and David Bowie. Could you tell them apart? Because back in the day, they were kind of, yeah. Very <laughs> good point. David Bowie said nothing but smiled at me. Bernishnikov was like, when is Paulie coming? And then all of a sudden I hear, back of my head, I hear this high-pitched voice. Who are these guys? And then he sits down. Mike Tyson. <laughs> So I'm sitting with these guys and I'm thinking, am I in a dream? I wrote this on Facebook many years later and someone wrote, I was your waiter that night. What? But I can't even, that's almost like a, a Joe Franklin show from another alien world. I know. Like, and, as then, we have Barishnikov and Mike Tyson. And then I was at a Writers Guild party and someone said, here, this is Mike Tyson's manager. I said, I got to tell him this story to make sure I know it was real. And he told, I went over and told me, he goes, oh, I know all about that night. Mike told me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, it's crazy stuff. It's crazy stuff. Now, it has not been crazy at all chatting with Richard Becker here in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, now, Richard is staying. He's going to stick around and talk to some, you know, oh, okay, Mike Tyson, David Bowie, Robert De Niro, who gives a shit. But coming to the neighborhood momentarily are Ronald Rand, an actor and a, a writer about acting, and also theater critic Eva Heinemann, who has been reviewing for many, many years. She hosts her show. So, She's coming. They're going to be playing the Today Yesterday trivia quiz with Dave, who's, who's coming right here, and, of course, Richard Bater. But I've got to tell you, folks, please, this Monday, which is actually the producer's of uh, this show's birthday, Dave's birthday, if he were in New York, he already spent his, his birthday, he would spend it at the St. Clemens Theater, basically because it's, it's free. It's a free ticket to a reading of the play Zaglada by Richard Zaglada. Z Zaglada. There he is. So you can see it. And, and with Len Cariou, the legend from Applause and, and from Sweeney Todd and what's the TV show, Blue Blood things. He, yeah. That Len Cariou is starring on Monday night at St. Clemens in Zaglada by Richard Bittes. So Richard, I, I, first of all, thank you. Thank you a million times. Just, I, 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 I want to talk to you for another hour and just forget right. the rest of the show, but I can't. So you stay there. I'm going to play some music. I'm going to wish everybody a most, most happy late January. There's no holiday to talk about. I'm just happy late January. And Dave will be right with you. And shalom.